This is an episode about the quality of one's word. It involves glory, destruction, friends and enemies. This is the 1915 Golden Handshake 501 Review, now on Den and Denim. We know that Levi's and Cone Mills made some kind of secret agreement with each other in 1915. And that's it. The who, where, and how takes some detective work. First, we figure out who could have been at this meeting. The companies, Levi's, Strauss and Company, ruled the western states for workwear. Cone Mills was an up-and-coming cloth manufacturer. Both were ready for national attention. For the people, there were only two people authorized at Levi's to make such a decision. Jacob Stern, Mr. Strauss's nephew, was the head of Levi's on paper, but wasn't often involved in factory decisions at this point. It was most likely Simon Davis, son of Taylor Jacob Davis. Simon Davis is responsible for a lot of great things at Levi's during the early 20th century. The Valencia Street factory was his baby. He introduced the award-winning kids' coveralls. During 1915, Simon Davis was the talk of the town. Cone Mills Denham was founded by Moses and his little brother Caesar. They went by the name of Proximity Cotton Mills. The company wouldn't be known as Cone Mills until 1948. Caesar Cone was the surviving founder of Cone Denim, and still very active in the business. By 1915, he had seven mills and was looking to expand. Where did the meeting take place? Well, there's a clue with the extra tag on the rigid pair. 1915... World's Fair was in San Francisco. That gives Cone a reason to be in San Francisco at the time. I can't find a better reason that puts Davis in North Carolina. It's likely that a well-to-do man like Caesar Cone would have arrived for the opening ceremonies of the World's Fair. That sets the stage in late February of 1915. Both Simon and Caesar were American-born sons of Jewish immigrants. Being in related industries, it's likely that they would have encountered each other. Simon Davis was known to frequent Schroeder's, the oldest German restaurant in San Francisco. What better place to take Mr. Cohn, the son of Bavarian immigrants? But as for the elements of the golden handshake that we do know, the two must have conversed about their similar backgrounds and the common aim to make a product worth buying. Levi's had been stitching their 501s from the same 9-ounce double X denim since 1873. Manufactured by Amiskeag. But Amiskeag could no longer keep up with the demand of Levi's growth. Caesar Cohn knew his materials and its possibilities. He promised to make the same quality double X white selvage denim the deal. Cohn Mills would supply Levi's with all the denim they required. Levi's would buy all their denim from Cohn. If Cohn made extra denim, then they were free to sell it to a third party. If Levi's needed additional extra materials, then they could find additional suppliers. However, Cohn Levi's relationship was top priority for both companies. And we do know the deal was sealed with a handshake. Neither party signed a document. The word of a gentleman was good enough. To the owner of this 501 gene, 1915 501 gene. The story of Cone Denim began in 1891, when brothers Moses and Caesar founded Cone Export and Commission Company. By 1905, they established a mill that would become renowned for setting the standard for quality denim. Cone Denim's White Oak Mill, named after a 200-year-old tree on its grounds. It continues to craft the most authentic denims for over a century. Regarded as a stronghold of textile history, White Oak remains an integral resource for its archives and an endless inspiration. In 1915, Cohn was approached by Levi's as a supplier, beginning a long-term commitment to one another. In the 1920s, 
Cohn started individualizing Levi's denim with red selvage, which is still synonymous with Levi's denim. By 1922, Levi's exclusively obtained all of its high quality denim from white oak. Nearly 100 years later, we are still unearthing archival details about fabrics we developed through our history with Cone. This gene is a celebration, replicating the combination of Cone fabric and fit from 1915. It carries the secrets of a hundred year history within its warp and weft. Enjoy yours truly, Levi Strauss and Company. This is a pair with several examples of historic features. 10 ounce white selvage denim, suspender buttons, exposed rear rivets, crotch rivet, single needle arcuate stitching with the thinnest, absolute thinnest arcuate stitching I've ever seen. And two classic features, two back pockets and a beautiful leather patch I have to warn you that the 1915 501s have the worst cinch I've seen. It's very fragile and just won't work. I've tried multiple ways of reattaching this cheap metal alloy, but ended up rubber banding it together for a few months, but then taking it to a tailor to be bar tack shut so I can hang it on the wall. I want to leave you on a good note and pay a visit to the two special souvenir items that come with a rigid golden handshake. 1915-501. One is the World's Fair Exposition Tag. This was awarded to Levi's in the 1915 World's Fair for the highest quality garment. It remained on the clothing for another 20 years. The other is the Seasonal Fall Winter 2016 Lookbook Tag. This looks like a pair of jeans. Then you open it and it tells you the golden handshake story. This is a replica of a Levi's ad from 1915, but back then, it was for the kids' coveralls. From the get-go, Cone Mills was full of surprises. There's the Rube Goldberg way of processing the thread from 1921. They invented the touchstone continuous dyeing process. They pioneered pre-shrunk 1932 and stretchy denim, 1962, and invented bleach denim on accident, 1969. But for technological advancements, nothing compares to the continued use of the Draper X3 looms. First used in 1947, yes, that's why 47501s are that year. This is the height of weaving mechanical design. Sure, there are more computerized machines, there ain't nothing with the soul of a Draper X3. White Oak Plant wasn't just a factory. It was a community of people doing what they loved and loving what they do. This place raised me because my mother worked here. This place raised my son. That love spilled into the denim. When we talk about Made in the USA, quality. It's about treating the factory workers as important members of the community. People who can work the job and get better over time while building families, having vacations, memories, goals, and the lives that we all want. For a century, that happened in Greensboro, North Carolina. Here's my father-in-law modeling his favorite pair. The legs are very straight. There's no tapering and no flaring. They sit below the navel, but the seat is shorter than most 501s, so you can let them rest closer to your hips without creating too much crotch tent. The sadness begins in 1983 when Western Pacific Industries tried to do a hostile takeover of Cone Mills. They used a Wall Street trading firm, Jeffries & Company. A young sales rep there named Jill Delaney conned Caesar Cone II out of his remaining shares. 
The second and third blows would come from the North American Free Trade Agreement and the World Trade Organization removing the caps of cloth imports. In 2003, Corn Mills had to file for bankruptcy. And thus, the stage is set for the most cartoonish villain a denim head shall ever encounter. Wilbur Ross. I'd like to say it was all about the almighty buck, because that's a logical understanding. But no, this maliciousness was born in the wretches of hell. Eunuch Voldemir here lacked the physicality to ever wear a pair of jeans and look cool. He knew that his political ambitions lay on the murder of America's heart. Cone Denim was taken to the slaughter. Oh, but Elmer Magoo didn't even have the guts to carry out the execution. He sold it to Platinum, a company who disassembles American companies, shipping off parts so that they can liquidate a little asset and destroy what generations have worked for. Where was old Anus McShit bag when this was happening? He was selling the American public his spiel on higher prices because things are made in China now. I said this was an episode about the quality of one's word. Thank you Wikipedia for letting us know that Pigworm Man dropped his college writing course because it was too tough, but I do know that Wilbur Ross does not subscribe to Den and Denim. So don't be such a Wilbur Ross and subscribe to Den and Denim. Every one of the 1915501s is very special in some way. A couple of them are numbered limited editions, but as we'll see, each one of them tells some kind of a story. Of course, I've been telling the story of the Rigid Pair, the Golden Handshake Editions, made in 2015 to celebrate the centennial of the Golden Handshake from 1915. Rigid is the only way you get the guarantee ticket. Their flashers were not on jeans until another 25 years later. As far as the distressed versions we have, there's the Sundance, heavily patched pair. These are probably the easiest to find. You'll see some nice patching over the butt area and vertical patching on the leg, along with some organic patching rips. And then there's, I think my personal favorite from all these, the Fallen Down. This is an archival piece, which features pan-sewn pocket flaps and belt loops made of the duck material. Nice contrast to see the orange of the duck against the indigo blue. There is a Lot 201, which is another archival piece, dated at 1915. Remember, the 201s are supposed to be the budget version, but in this case, they're just slightly variations. I think there's a bit of a green hue that comes off of the 201s from being a slightly different denim. There's also a limited edition Cone Mail Baylor, possibly named after this guy named Homer Baylor, not to be confused with the 1918 Homer Campbell jeans. This is an archival piece featuring some distression and also comes with a cool travel bag. A few other items I'd like to mention because they're related to the golden handshake are the indigo bandana, the stencil totes and truckers, these two sack coats were made to go with the 1915 501s. They are the Lot 67, which you'll see me wearing. There's also the Lot 71 in an electric stripe. I'm wearing the 1914 stripe sunset shirt, which just lends to the time period. The bad guy destroyed something beautiful, which we love. But that's never the end of the story. Denim has a lesson to teach us. As dark as things seem, the light will always shine through. As long as we remember, they can't take away those beautiful memories we've had. And those we are continuing to make, some of you for the first time today, years after the closure of the White Oak plant. Where do we go from here? 
Yeah, Cone Mills is still a corporate entity, but the name, the land, technology to make high quality selvage denim, these are still accessible. Stranger things have come back from the dead, and we are living in strange days because Wolf White Oak Legacy Foundation is a non-profit raising money to house the original Draper X3 looms and make use of them for educational and production services. Some of the white oak weavers have already been employed to weave. Receiving the call that they were actually going to start two looms up, I sit on the couch and cried. The denim product is being sold under the name of the mill before the Cone Brothers bought it and the one they originally used, Proximity Manufacturing Company. Type 1 jackets from Runabout were made in California in 2021 from denim woven on a Draper X3 in Greensboro, North Carolina. Tellison is making a pair of jeans from this wolf denim. It was a limited edition run and the project has a long way to go. You can donate here if you got the heart and some cash. Personally, I'm putting everything I have into starting my cookie business, Jesco Mania Cookies, gourmet cookies that raise funds for animal charities. But the channel wants to do its part too. So once this channel is monetized, this video will be a fundraiser and proceeds will go to Wolf. We just need like 100 subscribers to get there. Every step makes a difference. Let's make sure a new generation of Americans know how to weave on a Draper X3 loom. Despite all the attempts by corporate greed, we aren't living in a denim dark age. Levi's is currently using amazing Japanese denim. The Cone Mills Levi's out there are plentiful at the moment. This pair celebrates the marriage between two great companies that helped create a 20th century icon. It's got a classic straight leg, that's the reason we wear 501s. Yeah, it's got a crappy cinch. We buy these jeans because they're made tough, because they represent the first of a particular garment. We wear them because they look badass. And we wear them because they tell a story. Two pairs of 501 tell the story of the 1915, made in 2015. I'm Den, this is Den and Denim. Thanks for watching.